Hi everyone, it's Blake with ChessPathways.com, and today we're doing a game analysis video. This is a game I found on the Chess.com forums, and it was posted by a player named Azygus Wolf. I think I got that right. And this game stood out to me and impressed me when I found it on the forums, because from my understanding, Azygus Wolf is a player rated less than 1,000. He's a newer player to chess, and he did two really good things that a lot of players of this rating don't do. Number one, he gave lots of comments about this game. He wanted help analyzing it, he posted it to the forums, asked stronger players for help, and he didn't just post the game. You see a lot of players doing that on these forums. They'll just throw their game on there and say, hey, someone analyzed this. But Azygus Wolf didn't do that. He gave very detailed comments about what he was thinking at various moments of the game, and that's so helpful in getting insight into the player's thought process and talking about what can be improved. And secondly, he chose a game that he lost. He chose a game that he struggled with. Um, another thing a lot of players do is they want everyone to analyze the games they've won, but there's usually a lot more that can be learned from a game that you've struggled with, where you made mistakes, so that you don't repeat those mistakes in the future. So let's get to it. Azygus opens with pawn to d4, perfectly normal opening move, e6, and now Azygus plays e4, which is a completely normal move, but he made an interesting comment here. He said he played this move to capitalize on Black's weak response referring to this move e6. And if you're newer to chess and you've just learned the opening principles that state that you should try to fight for central space, um, I could see how this move might look weak, this move e6, but it's not really a weak move. It's a somewhat normal move, if not the most popular in the opening, um, because it's going to support you playing d5 and contesting the center later. Um, so that's, that's just an interesting comment to point out. But after e6, e4, e4 is a good move by the way, fighting for the center, um, Black played this move g5, which is not a good move. He mentioned he'd never seen this move before in this position. Um, there's, there's a reason for that. It's because it's, it's not a good move. Um, it just really creates a target. It doesn't really fight for any crucial squares in the center. Um, it weakens your king side if you ever plan on castling that way. And if you do want the bishop to come to that g7 square right here, um, you really should be playing g6 and just keep everything more compact. There's no need to commit to a move like g5 so early. Even here, though, I wouldn't play g6 because this bishop already has a path to develop on that you opened last turn. Um, this doesn't strike me as the kind of position where you play a move like g6. Even that would be a little weird to me. So let's see how he responds to this move g5. He plays the move e5, and he comments that he wants to do this to press his positional advantage and create more space for himself. And again, it's just amazing to have access to these comments. It really gives you an insight into the player's mind. We're only three moves into the game, but you, you already get this feeling that Azygus is a player who really values space, which is great. That's something that definitely needs to be ingrained in newer chess players. But we have to remember, there's more goals in the opening than just gaining space. You do want to control space, but you also need to develop your pieces and get your king to safety. In this position, White controls the whole center. White has the pawns in d4 and e4, his bishops have scope to move, his knights can develop. If I were why, I would be more inclined to start developing some pieces than to keep pushing for even more space. So white plays e5. And nothing wrong so far, of course. No, none of these moves white are playing is, are bad. Uh, black plays d6. White plays knight to f3. So black continues with g4. And instead of retreating the knight, white throws in the move bishop to g5, um, which is interesting. Azygus probably saw that the move was safe. Um, obviously, black can't take this knight because the queen is under attack. Um, and there's nothing black can do to win material here. Um, but it's, I don't think it's a good move because after bishop e7, white does have to exchange off pieces here, and you don't really want to exchange pieces when you have a space advantage. Remember, one of the big advantages of having a space advantage is that your pieces aren't going to be cluttered. Your, your pieces are going to have plenty of scope, whereas your opponent's pieces are going to trip all over each other. Uh, we see in this position, this, this dark bishop it really doesn't have nearly as much scope as the white bishop, and I think white would have been better off not throwing in this move bishop to g5 and just moving his knight. And Azygus made a really interesting comment about this situation where he said he'd heard about good and bad bishops, and he thought that it was okay to trade off his dark squared bishop because his king is on a dark square. That's a really interesting comment. Um, so when we're talking about good and bad bishops, what we're talking about is it has to do with the central pawns, at least in most situations. Let's go ahead and... oops. Let's go ahead and just look at a situation like this, where the central pawns are really fixed on their squares, there's no more pawn tension. White has these pawns on dark squares, and black has the pawns on light squares. This leads to, the, to black's light squared bishop being considered a bad bishop, just because it's really hemmed in by its own pawns. It can't really do a whole lot here. But now, when you have a space advantage, let's go back to this position, after g4. 
white doesn't really have a bad bishop here. White has a space advantage. Um, that's one of the advantages of having a space advantage. Both your bishops have plenty of scope here. I don't see any reason to call either of those bishops bad. And he mentions the color his king is on. That really doesn't have much to do with a good bishop or a bad bishop. And remember, this isn't the king's permanent home anyway, right? We know this king is going to want to get castled. At any rate, white exchanges bishops on e7. And again, none of, none of this is a mistake so far for white, really, especially when we're talking about players of this level. The number one thing to avoid is losing material, losing pawns and pieces for free. If you're not doing that and you're following the opening principles, you're, you're really off to a good start. So white's doing fine, and white here plays knight to g5. And he points out, he thinks now that this is a bad move because the knight's undefended on this square. Um, the queen's kind of eyeing it, and this turns out to be true. For example, if I was black here, I would exchange pawns. Um, it turns out white really shouldn't take back. White should take on g4, but now white's center has kind of disintegrated. But if white takes back, uh, for example, something like this looks pretty, pretty annoying for white. Um, the queens get exchanged, you know, your king can't castle, and some move like maybe knight to g6. It's not easy for white to defend this pawn. In fact, I think this pawn is just going to be lost. There's no way to defend this, this overextended pawn, um, because again, white's center fell apart, and this knight, it's not really clear at all what the knight's doing here anymore. So I think white was correct to criticize that move, but something interesting happened, and this is really common at, the, at this level. Um, instead of looking for a solution like this, black just saw that he could attack the knight, so black attacked the knight, and played h6 and kicked the knight to a much better square, in the center of the board. After h6, the knight gets to come to e4. So the lesson there is don't just make attacks because you can. Don't just see that you can attack a piece and attack it. Really think deeper about the position than that. And here black played f5. So after f5, white gave this, this check with the bishop. Um, pause and see if you can find a better move for white. f5 is really one of the first huge mistakes of the game, and white could have really punished this. So I don't know if Azygus uh, doesn't know the en passant rule or just forgot about it here or didn't consider the move, but it turns out that just taking en passant uh, <laughs> gives white an enormous advantage. White wins a pawn, the knight is now under attack, uh, this pawn is now under attack by the queen, and this king is going to get extremely exposed. And white's not only up a pawn, but uh, the attack is going to be overwhelming. So keep on passant in mind. Remember, when you have a space advantage like this, when you have this pawn on e5, your opponent can't just shove right past that pawn and negate your space advantage and start building their own space. That's part of the point of the space advantage. You are allowed to take on passant if your opponent uses their move of two of a pawn to bypass the capture square of your pawn. So instead, white played this bishop to b5 check. And another thing I noticed, this is the second time it's happened in this game already, but it looks like Azygus likes to respond to threats by creating his own threats. We saw this back here on move 4 when his knight was attacked, and instead of saving that knight right away, he decided to throw in this move and make a counterattack. And now again here, after f5, instead of saving that knight right away, or taking on Passant, of course, uh, he decided to give a check. Um, and there's good things and bad things about this philosophy. It's very good to build up the mentality that you don't have to yield to your opponent's threats. If your opponent makes a threat, your first instinct is to push your own will on the position, not to let them push you around. But you do have to be very careful. It turns out that both times in this game it worked out for, for white, but you have to really double check this when you start responding to threats with counter threats. Uh, for instance here, if black, if this worked in this position and black could just play c6, well, now, all of a sudden, white has two pieces under attack. His knight's under attack and the bishop's under attack, and that's, that's, you can't save them both. Um, unfortunately for black, it doesn't really work out like that in this position because white can throw in this with check, white can throw in this with check, white will get to save both pieces. But, of course, you won't always have resources like that, so you really have to make sure when you're going to respond to a threat by creating another threat that you don't end up in a situation like this where you end up with multiple pieces under attack and you can't save them all. In the game, black did play c6, actually, and white took a free pawn here on d6 with check. So after knight to d6 check, black played king to f8, and now white played this move knight takes b7. Yeah, and he mentions here that this is a poor move, and it is. Um, it's just not a safe move. Uh, that pawn is defended. You have one attacker of the b7 pawn, black has it defended, so if you take there, you're really just trading your knight away for a pawn, which we know is not good to do, right? Um... I think white can just simply retreat this bishop and he doesn't have any problems. If white were just to simply retreat this bishop, um, white's in great, great shape here. White is up a pawn. Uh, white has this amazing knight on d6 that can't really be easily dislodged. Black's king is extremely exposed, and I think white can start trying to open lines to that king by playing moves like h3 and trying to get the rook involved, or simply castling and bringing the knight into the game. 
Uh, White has a big advantage here. He has the extra pawn and the better position. He has everything you really could ask for. So when I see a move like this in one of my students' games, moves like, a move like knight takes b7, I never want to just dismiss it as, oh, that was a blunder. Um, you know, it's a move that doesn't make any sense. There's always a reason behind why people play their moves, and I think it's good to try to get into that internally in your own mind so you can know what caused that move to happen and so you can avoid doing that again. I read his explanation here, and he mentions uh, a wasted opportunity created by the fork. Um, I'm not sure what fork exactly he's talking about. I don't really see a fork here. Um, so I'd be, I'd be curious for Azigas to elaborate on that comment. Maybe he was talking about a couple moves ago. Maybe he panicked because he realized there's two pieces under attack here, and he thought he had to do something drastic. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But after knight, take, uh, after, uh, knight takes d6 check, there, there's not two pieces under attack. White is fine to just simply retreat this bishop and be fine. So maybe being less panicky is the solution there, just taking a closer look. So after knight takes b7, black recaptured. Now white retreated the bishop, bishop to c4. Black plays knight to d5, improving that knight. And white plays queen to d2. Yeah, and he mentioned he thought there might be better moves. Um, no, I think queen d2 looks reasonable to me. Um, the queen does have good board coverage here, as he puts it. It restricts a lot of the squares the knight could possibly go to, like uh, f4 and b4. Um, and remember, you still have to develop your pieces. You still had five pieces just sitting here on the back rank. You do need to move your queen somewhere useful and move the knight to c3, probably. Um, so yeah, no nothing wrong with queen d2. White is in a tough situation here. White is down a piece. And whenever you're down a piece, um, you know, usually something pretty drastic has to happen for you to get back in the game. Um, but at this level, you know, you, you fight back. You just, you get your pieces into the game. You, you know, you hope your opponent makes a mistake and you wait to capitalize on it. Black plays queen to g5. I like this move because black's up a piece and black would like to trade queens here. If you're up a piece and you can trade queens, you really end all the checkmating threats and you really increase your chance of just getting to an endgame with an extra piece that you can convert to a win. And white played queen to a5. I really like this idea to not exchange queens, keep the queens on the board. Unfortunately, though, I don't think this works out um, because I think white forgot that this queen can swing down here to c1 and cause all kinds of trouble. In fact, he actually mentions this, that after queen c1, uh, it's actually checkmate. White can only play king to e2, and the knight to f4 is checkmate. So this is a big lesson, and this is still a kind of mistake that I sometimes make. Always look for alternatives. I can't tell you how many times I've lost a game because of this kind of thinking. It happens to everyone. I say, oh, my opponent wants to trade queens. I don't want to trade queens. That's really bad for me. I don't want to get to this end game, so I'm going to play a move that keeps queens on the board. And you play a move like queen a5, and you don't realize that you, it's kind of out of the frying pan into the fire. You found something to avoid that was bad, but the alternative is a lot worse. So always remember to ask yourself those key questions. Ask yourself, what, could, what, will, what will my opponent do if I make this move? I think if you just ask, what will my opponent do after I play queen to a5, it's really easy to find queen to c1. He even found it in his annotations, he just didn't find it before he made the move in his haste to avoid this queen trade. If you sign up at my site, actually, chesspathways.com, I'm actually giving away a free move-by-move move by move guide to chess thinking, which covers all these considerations you should be asking yourself every turn to kind of internalize this thought process, and one of them is always, before you make a move, what will my opponent do? Okay, but black misses this opportunity. After queen to g5, white plays queen to a5, and uh, black does not play this checkmating idea. Black just develops a piece and plays knight to d7. Which, it's good to develop a piece, but it's, it's uh, <laughs> obviously not good when the alternative is just checkmating your opponent. So, white plays knight to d2, developing a piece and closing this checkmating line. Black plays king to f7. And I think I like this idea by white. White exchanges the bishop for the knight, an equal trade, to allow his queen to access c7 and create this fork here between the, uh, the bishop and the knight. That's a really good idea. So bishop c8, I think, is the only way to defend both pieces, but now white can pick up this pawn. And white's fighting back. White actually has three, p uh, three pawns in exchange for the piece now. White has eight pawns, black has five, so that's just about full compensation. And at this point, white has the safer king because this, this black king's really exposed, and the rook's under attack, the pawn's under attack. Uh, I think white might already have an advantage again. Black really uh, messed up by missing the easy checkmate. So rook to b8, uh, saving the rook, but that allows this, this uh, extra pawn to be picked up, and now white has four pawns for the piece. Uh, I think black can just try knight to b6, though. That defends everything, right? That defends the pawn, that defends the rook. Um, that probably was worth a try, although now there's some, some annoyances here with check, although I think you can block everything. Yeah, I, th I think black is better off trying to defend everything like this with knight to b6 than giving up this, this key central pawn, this fourth pawn. So rook to b8, white takes uh, queen, queen takes d5, check. 
king g7, and now e6. This move looks really logical, as uh, Azaiga said, it attacks the knight and pushes the pawn towards promotion. But it's actually a mistake. White definitely needs to get this king to safety somehow before opening up the center like this. And black can finally exploit this. Remember, if you don't castle, it's eventually going to come back to hurt you if this center opens up. After e6, black has a really nice idea here that he missed. It's pretty tricky to find, actually, but go ahead and, and take a look. Pause the video if you want to. What would you play here as black? So if you're back with me, black can actually uh, win this pawn, <laughs> this, this e6 pawn. Black can play knight to f6. And this is a double attack. This attacks the queen, and it attacks the pawn. And white has no checks here. And you might think, well, the queen can defend the pawn, uh, but it actually can't. No matter where the queen goes to try to defend this pawn, black just takes it anyway. And the queen cannot take this bishop because of these pins. We see that white is finally, uh, you know, losing because this king never escaped the center, and the center has now been blown wide open, and it's going to cost white his queen. So in this position, I might recommend castle queenside. Um, of course, you can't castle kingside yet because this knight is now undefended and the queen can take you, so you want to avoid that kind of situation. Really, ideally, white would have castled a long time ago in the opening and instead of, uh, you know, playing moves like, uh, like e5 here with no pieces developed, uh, like uh, moving the knight around. Um, if you really focus on those fundamentals in the opening, just develop your pieces, control space, and get castled, and really try to balance all three. I know it's easier said than done. Um, but if, if you can get your king to safety early, you won't have to worry about these kind of situations where the center gets blown open and your king and queen suddenly get caught up in some pin on the e-file. Back to the position here after e6, after white plays this move pawn to e6, um, black does not find this move knight to f6. Black actually plays rook takes b2, uh, which, uh, as Iga says, is not even a move he saw. Um, and indeed, it does kind of look strange because this doesn't, this only wins a pawn. This doesn't threaten to win any pieces or anything. And uh, it looks like black's giving up a piece for, for free here. So it is kind of a strange move, and it's not a good move. Um, it's interesting because uh, Azaigus comments that um, it's, it's a move he completely missed. It was the start of his downfall. And it's, it's just interesting to me that earlier in the game, he was, he was really happy to counter threats with his own threats, um, you know, show that psychological you know, strength that the opponent's not going to push him around. And then here, black gives him really a free piece. White really can just take on d7, so it's interesting um, that is, I guess, thinks this move was, was the start of his downfall. White, White is safe here. White can take this free piece, and White has a big advantage in this position. Uh, White says it was foolish to take on, on d7, but that's just not the case. White's doing great here. White's no longer down a piece. Black's king is just about as unsafe as White's king, if not even less safe. And White has some extra pawns, including this very strong pawn on d7. So Black takes a pawn on c2 and does threaten this checkmate, but that, that's fine. White can defend that. White goes ahead and gives check. Black plays king to g6. And here, white has all kinds of ideas with which win. Um, one nice idea um, that's a little hard to find is queen to e8, uh, with the idea that the rook, if the rook takes you, your queen just regenerates, basically. <laughs> and you, you want a rook, and of course your queen can just swing back and defend this checkmate, and you're just up tons of material. That would be one good way to finish the game. Going back to after queen g6. Um, but even if you don't find queen e8, um, even simply castles is <laughs> very, very good for white. Just give up this knight, because if black takes this knight, you're going to get a piece back. You can capture the bishop on c8, um, and you finally get your king to safety. And white's just up material here. This is just really good for white. Black's king is exposed. Your king is safe now. Um, white has a huge advantage here. But instead of finding a move like this, white went ahead and captured this free rook, but it's not check, so black is free to give this checkmate, to capture the knight and give checkmate. Um, so it's interesting here. He, he kind of goes over this without too much comment. He just says, game over, mate in two. Um, I feel like he tried to explain this away by, by this sequence of moves that started a couple moves ago and said that this all started with, like, uh, rook b8 and rook takes b2. Instead of really taking responsibility, he just missed the, the, the checkmate in two moves. If he's, he's still completely fine here. He, was not, he did not lose this game until he missed this checkmate in two moves and took this rook. If white simply sees this checkmate and makes almost any other sequence of moves, either start giving some checks or play queen to e8 or just castle um, and just defends that checkmate, white's good. Um, so there's a lot of takeaways from this game. Hopefully this wasn't too overwhelming for newer players to take in. Um, as I guess, keep doing what you're doing. If you keep this up, if you keep playing games like this and analyzing them and taking people's advice to heart, um, you're going to skyrocket in your rating. Um, please remember to check out my site, chesspathways.com. Uh, we're giving away a free move-by-move -move guide to chess thinking. We have a video section um, with game analysis, a comprehensive beginner's course that's being built. Um, I'm really excited for what this site has to offer. 
Um, so thanks everyone for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks.